Even gentlemen, how y'all doing? Woo! You're all excited about something. We'll talk about that later. Use about the last two minutes of your study time tonight to talk about that. Don't use all 40 minutes while you're sitting in your groups. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. We're in verses 12 through 21 tonight. Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 21. We're going to read the text, then I'm going to pray because I'm not ready. And then we'll get into the study. And Lord willing, we'll get you into groups pretty quick. So, starting verse 12, Paul writes, Not that I have already attained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things." but our citizenship is in heaven. And, for, and from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we take a moment in this letter of Paul's, that we would really hear what he has to say, and it would be part of who we are, not just today, but in the many days to come. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that as we run this race that you set before us, Lord, with endurance, we would have our mind always focused on the end, so that, Lord, it would affect where we stand at the starting line tonight. We pray these things, Lord, in your holy name. Amen. All right, guys, tonight's text, uh, it's, it's Got this kind of inspiring view, if you will, into the heart of the Apostle Paul. Now, if you remember last week, Pastor Matt gave his one-sentence resume for Paul. And it was pretty impressive. He was a really good dude. He did a lot of amazing things in the religion of Judaism. He was well-known. He was probably well-off. He had a lot of pull, a lot of power, a lot of the things that many of us strive for. And this passage offers us a powerful encouragement for us as believers with an, to live with an eternal mindset and view our heavenly citizenship over the temporal thoughts and earthly circumstances that so often surround us. Paul said at the end of his impressive resume, the thing that I love the most out of that whole resume, he counted it all as dung. It was poo. It wasn't worth anything. And so often we think that the things that are worth something, you know, they're things that people will point to on the TV screen and say, there's a guy with power, or there's a guy with authority, or there's a guy with nice clothes, or there's a guy with a nice car, or there's a guy with this, or there's a guy with that, or there's a guy that's super spiritual and I'm not. And Paul says, look, I want you to understand what's important. We need to keep our eyes fixed on what lies ahead and up, not becoming distracted by the fleeting thoughts of the things of the world that are down here and left behind in our wake. In his teaching, we're going to unpack Paul's words and how they provide sort of a roadmap, roadmap going forward. I don't want you guys to think about anything that's happened even last night, tonight. I want you to think about from here to eternity, right? From here to eternity. Don't worry about what's taken place. That's already happened because there's nothing you can do about it. And most of you are excited that it happened anyway. But what about tomorrow? And tomorrow's tomorrow. And eight years from now, and 10 years from now, and 20 years from now, and 30. See, Paul, in this text, he talks about 
the most important pursuit, his pursuit of Christ in verses 12 through 14, this mindset of maturity that he talks about in 15 through 19, actually by talking about those who are immature, if you will, and then our hope of eternity, which is where I really want us to to land the plane and hopefully go to our groups with something to talk about. So let's take a, a brief look at these again. Paul begins by acknowledging his own imperfection in this ongoing journey of faith. Even as a seasoned apostle, he's quick to clarify that he is not already attained, that he has not arrived, that he hasn't reached some sort of spiritual perfection, right? I think so often what we think we're gonna do, and some of you guys, you might even be there, you're like, you know what, I don't have that problem anymore. First of all, let me just tell you, the first time you say you don't have that problem anymore, it's probably gonna come around the corner next week, right? I don't have that problem anymore, or, or I, I, I'm, I'm beyond that, or I'm above that, or I've learned that, or I've got that, I've attained that, I've achieved that, I've arrived at this certain place. Paul is 30 years into ministry, and I dare say his ministry is better than any one of ours ever will be, and he's like, still ain't got it, still not there, still haven't arrived, Right? This shows us how humility is foundational for every believer, no matter your stage of walk. So often I think even in the church we try to say, well, you know, I've got a lot of guys that I pour into. I hope someone's pouring into you. Because if you keep pouring out and you're not pouring in, you're going to drain out and there's not going to be anything left of you. And we should all be saying there's still more to learn. There's still more ahead. I want to press on towards that goal for that prize. The Christian life is not about reaching a point where we have arrived, but about continually pressing forward towards greater personal knowledge of Jesus Christ, deeper intimacy with Christ. Paul's language of pressing on conveys the idea of an athlete in a race, exerting every ounce of energy just to get towards that finish line. I truly believe that Paul, if not a fan of the sports that were going on in the first century Roman Empire, he certainly witnessed a lot of them and saw a lot of what was going on, and maybe looked at all the other fans and said, those people are crazy, like cowboy fans. Why do you people root for them? Right? Amen. I gotta bring you low to bring you back to Jesus, man. I just gotta take you there. (laughs) Suffering for the Lord, there you go. (laughs) Now, Oh, yeah, and then use them for no reason. I I truly believe (laughs) the games of Paul's day, okay, I'm sorry, it's my fault, I brought it up. The games that Paul had had witnessed in that day in the first century were likely the Roman games that are called the Roman Ludi or the public games, and they included gladiatorial conquest and chariot races and athletic competitions, a lot like the early Olympics, and uh, theatrical performances. We won't talk about those guys. Now, Paul travels... His travels took him all over the Roman Empire, and he probably saw a lot of these, and he probably spent time in the cities where these were really big. We know he did, in places like Corinth, Ephesus, and Rome itself. The the image of straining towards the goal is just so instructive for us because for us, it reminds us that the Christian life requires perseverance. It's, It's always about pushing out. It's always about going forward. It requires focus. It requires discipline. We're called to pursue Christ passionately, just as Paul did. He mentions this upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's the ultimate prize for all believers. I just want to be in the presence of Christ. That's it. This call points us towards eternity where all of the full rewards of this life await. In a cross-reference, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Paul again calling on the ludi or the games, the the most famous of which was the Ismathean games, which took place in Corinth, he looks at the training and he looks at the attire of the athletes, particularly those that are running races. And check this out. The guys that ran races, they ran naked, you know? They didn't have any clothes on because the clothes were, they were an impediment. They were extra weight and they were extra drag. So these guys ran with nothing to hide. 
and they ran with all that they had. Uh, the, you know, if you watch the Summer Olympics, anybody watch the Summer Olympics at all? Okay, I watched a couple of things, a little bit, because I don't have TV, but I saw it on YouTube, little events. Swimming and track, man, their uniforms get different every single year. And it's always about trying to get an, a tenth of a second speed in the water. Or, or one step on the guy that you're racing against. And so we might think they're immodest or tight fitting or whatever, but the whole idea is to get every single, anything that would cause drag, anything that would hold them back off their bodies so they can get there the fastest and win the prize. Just as an athlete removes anything that might slow them down, we too as Christians are called to get rid of all the distractions, all the sins, and all the things that slow us down in our pursuit of Christ. What's slowing you down? What is the thing that's like, well, you know, I really, really was getting into my Bible study, but man, candy crush, you know, you know? Oh man, you know, or, or, or I just want to check the scores from the games, or I just want to do this or just do that. And, and it just pulls you aside. And before you know it, you burn the whole 45 minutes you were going to spend with Jesus, right? No, it wasn't that. I was checking to see if we've won the house yet, you know? Important stuff, Dave. Put it all aside. Fixing our eyes on Jesus keeps us focused on the ultimate goal, and that ultimate goal, as we'll see, is eternity. This, this, is, this closer walk with Jesus is what Paul pursued, even when many folks that had a resume like him of 30 years in ministry could have said, you know what I'm gonna do? I deserve to take a rest. Paul says, I'm gonna press. I'm gonna press on towards this goal. And I don't think... I don't think rest ever entered Paul's mind until he went home to be with Jesus. Let's read on. It says, let those, well, we, we read this part, so I'm just gonna get into it. Paul's undying pursuit was largely born out of a mindset of maturity. How many of you guys think you're mature? <laughs> yeah, that was good. Matthew went, <laughs> put my hand down low. You know, we, but okay, when it comes to this, that punk guy at work, you know, the new dude. You're mature compared to him, right? Or the kids in the house. Man, I'm going to teach my kids how to be mature. And then you do something that's like more childish than your four-year-old, which I do all the time. Maturity is this thing that is a mindset that is born into Christians as they spend time in, with Christ. It's born out of humility, it's born out of pursuit, and it's born out of discipline that comes from the Lord. We see now that Paul shifts from his personal testimony to this call that he has for all believers, and he says, look, I want you to have the same mature mindset. He acknowledges that spiritual maturity is marked by a continual pursuit of Christ in verses 12 through 14, and he encourages these Philippians here to follow his example as well as the example of other mature believers. Look at this letter. This letter is all about following examples, and all of those examples are about humility and service. Maturity is not standing up here and having everyone look up to you. Maturity is being among everyone and serving everyone else and realizing you don't deserve to be served. And it's a blessing just to be a servant for Christ. Follow the examples of these other guys. Follow these examples of Timothy. Follow the example of Epaphroditus. Follow my example and follow the example of Christ, Philippians chapter two. This call to imitation is a powerful one. It goes back to over so many verses already covered in Philippians. Discipleship and mentoring are vital aspects of this Christian walk and maturity comes from walking with people whose walks you admire. Paul warns of those who live as enemies of the cross of Christ. He's comparing them to a mindset of maturity that he and other believers have. He says there's other individuals out there and they're characterized by their own focus on earthly things, their own desires, their own appetites, their temporal attitudes and priorities over the eternal reward that awaits believers. Paul describes their end as, well he says that their God is their belly, right? They're only living for self-indulgence where immediate gratification is prioritized over eternal reward. And Paul describes their end as destruction, which serves as a sobering reminder for each and every one of us of the consequences when we don't live with an eternal mindset. If we live for today or yesterday or tomorrow or the next week or the next month or the next gig or the next job or the next promotion or the next this or the next that, we're not looking far enough. 
because we have to go all the way to the end, to the end of the story, and the end of the story is eternity with Jesus. That's the mindset he wants us all to have. That's what he says we need. The contrast between the mindset of the mature Christian and the mindset of those focused on earthly things is echoed in Colossians 3, 1 and 2, where it says, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are of the earth. This eternal mindset is crucial for faithfully walking out our walk with Christ. This, uh, this helps us to remain steadfast and immovable when all the things are coming against us and all those temptations and distractions come our way. When we focus on what is eternal, our heavenly calling and future with Christ, we're less likely to be drawn away by anything temporal and any of the temporary pleasures that the world has. How mature are we truly? I, I, I guess... Uh, the measure of that could be just how far down the road our focus truly is. If I'm mature, I'm not thinking about me even anymore. I'm thinking about the next generation, I'm thinking about my kids, I'm thinking about the future of the church, the future of the ministry, the future of this. That's down the road. We already see that the enemies of the cross of Christ are looking for immediate satisf satisfaction and fulfillment. So I would venture to say that those who love Christ are more concerned with the future satisfaction and that their lives fulfill God's plan for them than they are about what's gonna to happen to them tomorrow. Last couple of verses, and we'll get into our groups in just a second, it says this, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Paul concludes this section by pointing believers to their true identity. Do you know that your citizenship is in heaven? From the time that we said, Jesus, be the Lord of my life, we moved. And, and spiritually, we are seated at the right hand of the throne on high. Practically, we're seated in chairs in the middle of the sanctuary in a church in Rockwell, Texas. But positionally, we're in Christ. We're given all the heavenly blessings, all the attributes that are spiritually available to us. They're all there. And this is a profound truth that gives believers, it should give us both two things, encouragement and direction. Man, I should be excited about the fact that I know where I'm going. And I should be using that to give me direction in everything I do during the day. We're not ultimately citizens of this world. Our true home is with Christ in heaven. It's not here. This heavenly citizenship changes everything about the here and now. While we live on earth, we await our Savior. It says, just like it says, we await a Savior, Jesus Christ, who will one day transform us completely. Now, while the athletes Paul was talking about, well, uh, they received much less in the earthly plane for winning, for all that struggle, all that energy, all that casting aside the weights and running the races to be faster than everyone else. You know what they got when they finished that race, when they won after all that training in front of all those crowds? They often got a crown made of leaves. Laurel leaves, olive leaves. Greek traditions, they awarded victors the crowns of wreaths made of leaves, such as olives, laurel, or pine. In the Corinth Ismithian games, probably the ones that Paul remembered more than anything else, it was a wreath of pine or celery. I don't even like celery. It doesn't taste good, and it gets stuck between your teeth. All that training, all that casting us out of weight, striving for extra step or to be a little bit faster, a second faster in the water in modern days, they received a crown that perishes. We, on the other hand, you know what we get? We receive the promise of transformation. And that promised transformation is key to maintaining hope and perseverance in the Christian life. No matter how challenging life becomes, we have the assurance that Jesus will one day make all things new including our bodies. I am almost 59, and I feel it. With the men's group, it's easier, because in the morning with the men's forge, you just go, how'd you guys feel getting out of bed in the morning? They're like, oh, you know? It's important that we remember that we're getting this new body. It says this in 1 Corinthians 15, behold, I tell you a mystery. 
We shall, shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be ra raised imperishable and shall be changed. Man, I wanna be changed. I wanna go through that glorious transformation, not just, and it's not just spiritual, but physical. Our bodies that are now subject to decay and pain, they get fixed completely and totally and be transformed like it says, Christ's glorious body. This, this certainty of this future that's gonna waiting us, this transformation, it should empower us to persevere in the present. It reminds us that the difficult situations we face are temporary, but glory is eternal. It's everlasting. Philippians 3, 12 through 21, Paul paints this picture of the Christian life as a race towards an eternal prize. We're called to press on, to pursue Christ with all that we have and to set our minds on things that are above. This eternal perspective helps us to navigate life's challenges, remain focused on our heavenly calling and our citizenship, and to look forward to the glorious transformation that awaits us. Now, some of us are like, man, I wish that could happen today. But it's not time yet, because we're still here. And while we're still here, we should be trying to shave a second off the time it takes us to get into the presence of Christ. We should try to, try to get one step closer to Jesus. Try to do everything we can to cast aside all that we can so that our focus on eternity and with him grows and our relationship with him grows just the same. Paul's message to the Philippians is both a challenge and an encouragement. He says, man, keep striving for Christ. Don't stop, don't ever stop. Follow the example of those who live with eternity in mind and remember that your true home, it's not here, no matter who's in the White House. Your true home is in heaven. In this journey, let us remember Paul's final exhortation from 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. With an eternal perspective, our labor for Christ is never in vain. It's fueled by the hope of the resurrection and the certainty that Christ will complete the work that he has begun in each and every one of us. So men, keep pressing on, for the reward of eternity with Christ is beyond anything we can imagine. One day we get a crown. It's not leaves. It's gold, precious jewels. And it'll be beautiful for a second. And then we'll just throw it down at the feet of Christ because he's far more beautiful than that. Amen? Amen. Let me pray and we get to our groups. Lord, I thank you for these men. I thank you for this time together. I pray, God, that you would help us to keep our minds on you looking forward and up, even when all the things that have happened around us, good or bad, Lord, uh, they tend to slow us down. They tend to keep our focus off what's really important. Help us to have eternity in mind and to walk each step of every day with an eternal perspective. God, I pray that it would help us to be quicker to witness for you. Swifter, Lord, in, in restoring relationships, Lord, that are broken through sin. Uh, that it would make us, Lord, less likely to be tempted by the world. And God, that you would just draw us closer to you in the process. So we want to press on into your presence, Lord Jesus. And we pray these things in your holy name. Amen. God bless you guys. Group time.